Good afternoon. Uh, we shall uh, uh, we shall start. Uh, I'll do a brief presentation of uh, uh, Professor Paul Ant Paul Antras, um, who is closing uh, this uh, this event. Afterwards, uh, the president of the and myself. You should be sitting there, but uh, just imagine that the president is sitting there, and uh, afterwards uh, we'll say a. Uh, will say some, some words uh, wrapping up uh, the conference. Uh, Professor Antras uh, is um, he's a local boy, uh, born in Barcelona, uh, went to high school in Barce in, in, uh, also in Barcelona, then at, uh, uh, that was a Aula Escola Europea, then it was uh, Universidad Pompeu Fabra, and then he did not, he did not uh, spend time doing masters or things like that, went straight uh, to the MIT. He graduated from MIT in 2013, and then was hired by Harvard, and he has been there ever since. One of the advantages of go of studying at MIT is that you can be hired by, by Harvard immediately. Uh, and uh, anyhow, uh, he has done his career uh, there in these years. Uh, he has been many things, National Bureau of Economic Research in charge of uh, the working group of, tra of trade and, or and organizational uh, 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 trade. He's uh, currently, uh, the, uh, correct me if it is not correct, the editor of the quat Quarterly Journal of Economics. Huh? One of, one of, it's one of the editors. He's a rigorous, uh, he's a rigorous uh, person, uh, and has been in many editorials. Uh, word, words. He has had a number of awards: the Alfred Sloan Research uh, Fellowship, the uh, the, the prize uh, of uh, the Fundación Banco Banco Herrero. Uh, the, uh, and the, in 2015, he was uh, elected a fellow of the Economic Society. Um, he's, uh, he, he's a theorist, uh, uh, applied theory, he, his CV says. Uh, his uh, field is, uh, is international economics, uh, the, uh, the multinational uh, company. Uh, the, the multinational corporation, uh, you will see uh, uh, when he makes his presentation. He has uh, uh, written uh, quite a number of articles, a book, Global Production, Firms, Contracts and Trade Structure. And uh, I, quote, uh, from, uh, I quote from his uh, CV, although I am retranslating, here I have it translated into Catalan, I'll retranslate into English, uh, that, he's, uh, that uh, he, uh, he's currently uh, doing research on um, the, uh, the uh, global value change, and this is at the intersection of trades, inequality, and, uh, costs and, and the costs of uh, costly redistribution. Uh, and today he will be speaking on uh, uh, global value change, spiders and snakes. <laughs> so we are all very curious. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, let me, uh, let me begin by saying that I'm truly honored to be here as a local. Uh, it is really a privilege uh, to be able to address you here today in the first uh, Catalan Society Conference. Uh, it is also, I should say, it's also a privilege and an honor to be introduced by Andreu. I think I speak for many, many people here. I know many, many people here that feel um, that they probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the path uh, he led for us uh, in the U.S. and everywhere else, so I wanted to take this opportunity to express my personal gratitude, and, but I think I'm speaking for a lot of people. Now, in terms of the topic for today, um, I'm going to be talking about global value change. So uh, I wanted to start by putting this in some perspective and telling you perhaps uh, why I think I'm here today talking about global value change. 
So in order to understand that, I think we need to go back maybe 30, 35 years and sort of remind ourselves of three very important phenomena uh, uh, that happened in the world economy in those years. The first one is the ICT revolution. The second one is a process of increased and deepening trade liberalization, uh, largely in the, face, in the form of regional trade agreements. And a third one, uh, which has to deal with political development. So what I have in mind is, on the one hand, you have these technological developments that allow uh, firms to operate at a distance, to have different production uh, plans in different uh, countries and can transmit information with each other at a much lower cost than was uh, available before. A second uh, process of, uh, of uh, policy liberalization that basically enabled firms to uh, ship parts and components across plants at a much lower cost than it used to. And a third one is politics, which basically means that there's millions and millions of workers that used to be uh, in communist systems that become employable from the point of view of firms in Western countries that can now set up plans in Eastern Europe, that can now set up plans in China, uh, just to name a few. And obviously these are uh, developments that many people have written about and have emphasized uh, several aspects of it, but for the topic of today, I think they're particularly relevant for understanding why we now live today in a world where production processes are much more globalized than they used to be. Now this is obviously the emergence of global value changes a very uh, broad topic, so I cannot possibly speak about all the aspects of it. So what I thought is, I was going to tell you a bit about some of my recent work in this area, and I found it useful to kind of divide the presentation uh, by using this sort of uh, uh, terminology that I wish I had come up with. I think it's brilliant that I didn't. I should credit uh, uh, Dick Baldwin and, and Tony Venables for having come up to, with uh, of this, which is a sort of a taxonomy of types of global value chains that I think is a useful one where we're going to distinguish between uh, what we're going to call spiders um, and what we're going to call snakes. So what is a spider? Uh, I think the best way to illustrate a spider is to show you one. Uh, this is one example of a spider, uh, or at least what I'm going to call a spider. Uh, this is the uh, production of a uh, Dreamliner. Okay, so when we teach undergrads uh, trade, we, there's this uh, part where we teach about strategic trade policy and uh, we tend to give this example of Boeing fighting with Airbus in order to capture market share and how governments are subsidizing these firms to try to take market share away from the rival. And we think about it in terms of, you know, you have these Boeing planes that are produced in the U.S. and Airbus is produced in, uh, they're produced in Europe. The truth is, is that it's much more complicated than that. If you look at uh, a Boeing, if you look at an Airbus, it'd be very similar. About 70% of the parts that are produced, uh, uh, that, are, that are combined in the production of a Boeing uh, airplane, they're actually coming from abroad. So there's a vast amount of value added that is actually added <coughs> abroad rather than in the US. Why do I call this a spider? Because this is, uh, and there's many other examples of this, this is a production processes where there's an assembly location and there's uh, all these parts and components that are coming into that assembly location and they're combined together in this process of assembly that produces a final good that then is sold locally and might be exported. Okay, so it is as, as if we bring all the pieces and then there's these guys that are putting together the puzzle and then they ship the good. And uh, through the lens of uh, spiders, the process of trade integration is one where instead of uh, being in a world like the world that uh, David Ricardo was talking about 200 years ago in which countries were producing goods and maybe exporting them to foreign countries, we now live in a world where countries are interdependent not only through the exchange of final goods, but also through the legs of spiders, where we can now bring in goods through these legs and then produce goods that we, we might then export. Okay, so that's, as I'm going to tell you about later, might sort of raise new uh, issues for how we think about how countries are interdependent in, in the world economy. What about snakes? So a, snakes, uh, a snake, uh, or a global value chain in the form of a snake, is one that I can illustrate with, uh, uh, with the example of the semiconductors industry. So how are semiconductors produced? Uh, you all know that the raw material, the, the basic raw material is silicon. Silicon is coming from a bunch of places on Earth. Uh, but in order for it to be used for semiconductor production, it needs to be purified. And the process of purification might happen in a bunch of places. It so happens that Germany, uh, uh, this is a bit slow, but it, it so happens that Germany is a country where uh, um, you know, purification is, is particularly well done, so it tends to happen there. Once you've purified the silicon, you end up with a big, big cylinder uh, of pure silicon that then is cut into, uh, 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 into disks that we call wafers, and there's the process of wafer fabrication, which is this process where all sorts of sort of uh, high-tech stuff is done to the wafers, like you put the transistors and so on and so forth, 
And this is a high-tech process that used to be done in the US. That's where it emerged, that was, uh, where it was invented. But soon enough, people realized that there were high-skilled individuals in other parts of the globe that could equally do this. So there's production moved to Israel, uh, to uh, Ireland, uh, Singapore, Korea, Japan, etc. Now, that's not the end of the production process. There's a next step, which is the process of assembly, which is basically when you have the wafers, you need to cut it uh, and put them in, uh, cut them into, into units that then can be shipped to the electronics companies, which are obviously the guys that are using this in production. And that is a very different type of production process. It's very labor intensive. It used to be done in the US and rich countries, but soon enough, firms in those countries realized that they could actually have that done uh, in less developed economies. Uh, at a much lower cost, even if those chips might actually end up going back to the US. So you see that this snake, this production process, which is very much sequential in nature, it's not everything coming back to the US and put together, it's this sort of more sequential aspect of it where the good is flowing uh, uh, across the globe and value is being added at different stages. So now you might say, well, uh, you know, there's uh, spider elements to this, and there might be snake aspects to the production of a Boeing. Obviously, the world is a much more complicated thing than the one the world that I'm going to be telling you about in a second. But I still, I think it's useful to think about these different uh, broad types of uh, global value chains. So what I want to do today um, is I want to uh, uh, I want to think with you about first why we should care about global value chains, and then I'm going to try to illustrate. Uh, some aspects in, or some things we've learned, I think, in recent years in trying to understand um, how the world economy through the lens of this global value chain. So the first thing you might want to ask yourself is, um, why do I need to think about global value chains? What's, what did David Ricardo miss? What do we, we miss? Uh, uh, what do we miss when we think about a world in which countries are specializing certain goods, exporting goods, and importing final goods from other countries? Other, another way to put it is, um, should we care that when I look at world trade flows, uh, we're very far from a world in which what gets exchanged is final goods, and maybe up to two-thirds, if not 70% of world trade is in intermediate inputs. We might also ask ourselves, uh, does it matter that, unlike in a David Ricardo world, the guys that are on the buyer side, they're not consumers, they're actually firms. They're firms that are buying inputs from other countries. Does it matter that the importers are actually firms uh, that are buying multiple inputs from multiple countries uh, rather than consumers. Um, you might also ask yourself, does it matter, does this sequentiality that I was emphasizing for SNICs, does it matter? Do we need to think about models in which production is happening over time and value gets sequentially added? Does that matter for some things that we might care about? So uh, broadly speaking, I guess the question I'm going to ask, and, and as, as Andre was saying, uh, uh, I'm basically in applied theory, is that the question that I ask myself is, do we need new models? Or that is, if we write models that capture these things that were not present in previous models, does that change how general equilibrium models work? And more from an empirical point of view, does it change some of the predictions that come out of these frameworks, some of the perhaps qualitative or even quantitative things that comes out of these models? So what I'm going to do today, obviously, I, I have limited time, um, and I should leave some time for questions at the end. But what I thought I was going to do is I was going to give you a flavor of at least two papers of, of mine, two recent papers of mine, where I've sort of thought about some of these features that I just introduced. So I'm going to tell you about a spider paper, and I'm going to tell you about a snake paper. Okay, And, um, and then may, maybe we can talk about other things uh, uh, later on. And I should say that the first paper is uh, was recently uh, uh, accepted at the AER. It's joint work with Theresa Ford, uh, who's at Dartmouth, and Felix Tintelnot, who is at Chicago. And the second paper is a working paper with Alonso de Gortari, who's sitting over there, um, um, and who's a, a graduate student at Harvard and is uh, probably going to be in the market next year. So uh, <laughs> keep, keep an eye on him. <laughs> OK, so let me start telling you about uh, spiders. So in order to tell you about a spider, so let me step back for a second and, and, uh, and, and tell you about, um, uh, reminding you about, uh, about um, how we think about uh, trade flows in, in modern trade theory. So I'm going to depart a little bit from David Ricardo now. Uh, and the point that I want to emphasize is that um, uh, I want to think about aggregate trade patterns, uh, say for instance, and more narrowly, uh, US aggregate imports, as following from the aggregations of agents that make decisions as to whether to sell goods abroad or not or import goods uh, abroad or not. Okay, so this kind of, uh, I'm, I'm, I, want to th I want you to think more about this sort of new wave of work in, in, in international trade that thinks about trade from the perspective of firms uh, uh, making active decisions as to whether to participate in, in markets or not. 
Um, on the export market, this is a very uh, uh, sort of uh, well uh, studied in the sense of many papers that have shown that uh, when you look at uh, um, why countries sell to more countries than others, why uh, uh, the US sells more to Canada than say to Zimbabwe, to a large extent that has to do with the fact that there are more US firms that are actually select into exporting to uh, uh, Canada than to Zimbabwe. So this extensive margin of trade, that is the set of firms that are choosing to sell to a particular market is a particularly active one. And then there's what we call the intensive margin, which has to do conditional on a firm exporting in a market, what is the volume of trade of that transaction? Now, I don't have time to uh, kind of delve into that, but traditional trade theory and new trade theory, the work of uh, Halpern, Krugman, and others very much emphasize the intensive margin. And in recent years, it's been uh, partly because the data suggested that the extensive margin was, was key actually for understanding many phenomena. There's been much more interest on the extensive margin. Having said this, if you want to think about U.S. imports from the perspective of U.S. firms, that is, instead of thinking about perhaps the U.S. is importing more from more countries than others, not because their foreign exporters are selecting into buying into the U.S., but because firms like Boeing, Apple, and other firms are choosing suppliers in particular markets, maybe you want to think about that extensive margin as well. That is, maybe what sh we should be thinking is, why do some U.S. firms uh, choose to buy imports from certain countries and not others, and conditional on buying from a particular country, what determines the volume of this input or that input that they buy from? And that's what I'm going to call the extensive margin of imports. And take my f uh, word for it, I don't, I'm not going to show it to you uh, uh, here, this is very important. It's about two-thirds uh, of the variation in import volumes across sources in the U.S. is explained by the extensive margin. In the same manner that uh, uh, the in the extensive margin firm entry is important, uh, the reason why the U.S. buys imports much more from Canada than from Zimbabwe is because there are many, many more U.S. firms that buy from Canada than Zim from Zimbabwe. A second fact that also connects with the literature on exporting is that uh, the extensive margin doesn't seem to be random, uh, but rather uh, seems to be uh, related to um, uh, to certain uh, characteristics of firms. It is in the same manner that exporters tend to be larger and more productive than non-exporters on the import side, you see something very similar. The set of firms that buy inputs from many more markets than others tend to be more productive firms. Now what that basically suggests is that uh, perhaps uh, because there's this connection between the set of facts that motivated models of, uh, 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 of the extensive margin of exports, the same facts tend to uh, occur on the import side as well. Perhaps all we need to do is to go to those models, and I have in mind particularly Mark Mellitz's work, my colleague at Harvard, maybe we should just go to those models and relabel things. And what he calls an exporter, we're going to call an importer, and then we can just say we can explain all these facts with those models. Part of what I want to show you today is that even if you acknowledge the importance of spiders, you cannot just take those models off the shelf, relabel things, what he calls final goods, call it inputs, and be done with it. There's actually things that come out of a model that very much looks like that type of models that you wouldn't necessarily have anticipated uh, if you haven't sat down and sort of written that uh, model down. Okay, so that's what I want to uh, uh, do next. Uh, but let me t give you the gist of the paper first, and then maybe I'll give you a couple of details. So the gist of the paper is as follows. Um, so consider first the model of exporting. Okay, so I'm, think about a, a, a standard model like the Mellis 2003 paper. This is a paper that's, uh, it's a framework where uh, firms produce uh, differentiated varieties, that is a firm produces a good that for which there's demand abroad. And it's making a decision of where in, in the world that they're gonna sell that good. They're gonna sell it locally, but maybe there's demand for the good abroad, and they're gonna figure out whether they should activate that market or not. If there's sufficiently demand for that good, uh, maybe it's costly to ship to that country, but if demand is sufficiently large, they're gonna activate that market. And they're gonna do the market by, by market. Now what's key, a key simplifying assumption of that framework, why this framework is so uh, uh, nice and simple to aggregate, you get all sorts of sort of interesting things coming out of it, is because of the assumption that the marginal cost that the firm faces is constant. Okay, there's models with increasing returns to scale, but the marginal cost of production is constant. What that basically means is that the decision to uh, export to a given market or, or, or another, uh, these decisions are completely independent from each other. So you can basically solve a firm problem market by market, you have the firm problem, you aggregate, and you're done. And you can compute aggregate trade patterns. Uh, if I thought about taking that model and relabeling it, said, I'm going to now turn this into a model of importing, where perhaps it's uh, profitable to buy from that market, 
if the gain I get from importing from that market is large enough, enough I'm going to activate that market. I know I'm going to face cost of importing, but if it's large enough, I'm going to import it, and I'm going to do that input by input, uh, market by market, and I'm going to be done. Well, it's not so simple because when you're importing, if a firm chooses to import, if Boeing goes and says, I'm going to buy this part from France rather than producing it in the US, it is precisely because they think that this is going to affect their marginal cost. This offshoring is precisely what firms do to affect the cost they face for input. So it no longer makes any sense to think that a decision to offshore, to source inputs from a given market is going to be independent from the decision of the decision of buying from a third market. So this natural independence, which is a key simplifying assumption in canonical models of trade, is, it, I would argue, is sort of uh, uh, quickly inconsistent with uh, the motive uh, to actually import. So that basically leads uh, to interdependencies across markets in this uh, import decisions. That is, pinning down the extensive margin of imports is much more complicated. If you think about it and you start thinking about it, it's actually much more complicated than that. There's many layers of interdependencies. It's not just that whether I'm going to import from China is, is going to matter or not for whether I import from India. It's just in, across inputs, there's interdependencies too. Whether I buy an input locally or I go abroad and lower my marginal cost, that is going to impact my demand for other inputs. So that's all these layers of interdependencies that are going to affect not only the extensive margin, but also the intensive margin. So the question is, now that we realize that we cannot just use that model off the shelf, should we just give up? Or is there something that we can use so some of the insights of the literature we can use and sort of translate them into a model of importing that we can still make tractable. And that brings me to this first paper with Ford and Tintelnut where the answer is yes, we can, you know, there's ways to make this work. And what the paper does is it uh, provides a, a quantifiable uh, multi-country sourcing uh, model, a model where, uh, that we're going to map to U.S. data where firms in the U.S. are making sourcing decisions across various markets and for different inputs. Um, this is going to be a model that's going to generate, uh, generate a, a simple characterization of both the extensive and intensive margin of sourcing uh, in analogy to exporting models. As a matter of fact, it's going to turn out to be the case that it's a model that's going to, that's going to under some special circumstances, it's going to uh, map one-to-one -to, -one to the malice framework, uh, but it also happens to ma uh, map to this other uh, important paper in the trade literature, the Eaton and Cordon framework, which is uh, 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 um, the key quantitative tool used for trade uh, these days. And you know, I'm not going to have much time to tell you about this, but it's sort of interesting that we can sort of basically uh, go to different sort of key models of the literature by, uh, by looking at special cases. Now, uh, I'm going to give you a, maybe I'll spend five minutes on, on telling you exactly how we make this work and what comes out of it. Um, obviously, we show that the, uh, this interdependencies that I introduced uh, uh, intuitively are going to arise when solving the model. But still, these are interdependencies that take particular forms. It's not just the world is complicated. Our model says that it should be complicated in certain ways that when perhaps we can use uh, in a structural way when looking at the data. And that's what we do in the second part of the, the second leg of the paper in which we um, borrow from the industrial organization literature that has looked at uh, a similar type of problems. It's particularly, there's a paper in Econometrica by Panlegia uh, Bamwerk, who's at uh, Cornell now, uh, who's been studying the uh, uh, spatial, uh, um, uh, uh, who's been looking at the decisions of Walmart of where they open stores in the U.S., taking into account that the decision to open a store in a given town is obviously uh, uh, not independent of the decision to buy it in another market. So it's a, she was studying in an I.O. setting uh, entry decisions that are interdependent, and, and that sort of there was a nice connection to the problem that we were tackling. So there's algorithms, there's theorems that have been used in that literature to actually uh, structurally estimate uh, the, uh, the parameters that rationalize those decisions. So we uh, 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 leverage those uh, results to actually estimate the model with US data. And once we've estimated the model, we can look at counterfactuals. The counterfactuals shed light on uh, how certain shocks, and most notably the rise in China as a source of inputs for US firms, how that's that has shaped the landscape of U.S. manufacturing. Um, I'm going to uh, perhaps have time to kind of tell you a bit about uh, one result or another, but something, let me just flag it now, now in, time, uh, in case I run out of time, which is an interesting finding, which I think most people would uh, tend to think about this China shock uh, 
as something that has uh, had a very negative effect on U.S. employment. And there's empirical studies, recent ones, that have gotten a lot of attention that have definitely uh, uh, pointed this out. Now, we are not, uh, uh, you know, in our model, certainly uh, there's uh, certain aspects of this China shock that certainly lead to a decline in U.S. manufacturing, but what we point out is that the picture is actually much more complex because a lot of what China has been exporting to the U.S. is not just finished products, but actually there's a lot of parts and components that have flown into the U.S. What that has done is for the set of firms that have benefited from the shock by being able to buy inputs from abroad, this has lowered their marginal cost. And what we show is that given our estimates, for this subset of firms, uh, we would expect these firms to have increased their demand for not just Chinese imports, but actually local U.S. intermediate inputs. So there's a subset of firms in the U.S. for which the China shock has been a job-creating uh, shock. Uh, this is what the model says, this is what our counterfactual shows, and then we have a third leg of the paper where we ex exploit plausibly exogenous variation in the ability of U.S. firms to import from the U.S., uh, from China, uh, to actually show that this is actually what you see in the data. Yes, perhaps the China shock has destroyed jobs in the U.S., uh, but it turns out that uh, uh, there's a subset of firms that, as a result of this, have expanded, uh, uh, have increased the demand for U.S. workers, and those happen to be the firms that actually selected into China. So uh, this is this paper. Um, let me give you, uh, let me spend maybe uh, uh, five minutes in sort of giving you the backbones of, of how we make this work. So in terms of a model, this is, is going to, for those of you that are in the trade field, uh, um, this is going to be uh, uh, pretty familiar for those of you that are not in the trade field, I'm going to be speaking a different language for a few minutes, so you can tune out and then come back in in maybe five minutes. But this is a framework with uh, many countries, J countries. In the data, we're going to have, a bit, I think, about 65 countries. Uh, these are countries that are populated by consumers that are workers. Uh, on the preference side, this agents value uh, consumption of manufacturing varieties, and there's a, a, a continuum of, of varieties that are different from each other with a uh, level of differentiation uh, common for any con uh, uh, good pair and uh, governed by this parameter, uh, sigma. These final good varieties are produced by a, a set of firms, uh, a set of firms that is endogenous, so this is going to be a, a monopolistically competitive environment where uh, a process of entry is driving profits to zero and pinning down the number N of heterogeneous firms in that industry. And the firms are heterogeneous in the sense that they have a core productivity level that is different from that of other firms, and I'm going to denote that by fee. For those of you that have seen the Mallets framework, this should start looking familiar. Um, uh, as I said, there's a monopolistically competitive environment, and one departure from Mallets is that we're <coughs> going to make this final good non-tradable. Okay, so this is like a closed economy version of the Mallets framework, and the reason we do that is, um, although obviously Boeing, for instance, in my example before, is an exporter, we thought we would sort of keep trade flows as being associated with the legs of the spider rather than complicate and had, add an exporting decision to the model. So this is, uh, the way to do that is to make final goods uh, non-tradable. Now there is trade in the model because unlike in the Mallet's framework in which this set of heterogeneous firms is hiring labor and producing with labor, we actually have a production process that instead of using labor uses inputs and those inputs are not only uh, available locally but they're available abroad. And what firms are deciding is from which firms are they gonna, uh, from, pardon me, from which countries are they going to buy those inputs and uh, 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 conditional on uh, what we're going to call a sourcing strategy, which is the set of countries among the whole uh, many countries in the world, the set of countries they import from, uh, how much they're going to, you know, which inputs are they going to buy from which markets and how much are they going to buy. Now, um, this is basically the, the, the structure of the model. Now, there's the issue of... Um, how are you going to make this work in a tractable manner? And what we realized essentially is that the second part of the model where you have firms buying inputs from various markets, we actually had another paper in the literature, that's the Eden and Cordon framework, that was a natural framework to think about, to use to think about a theory of conditional on a set of countries from which firms buy inputs, how much in dollar terms would they buy from different markets? And that's essentially what we put here, and I'm, uh, I'm going to skip the details, is we essentially embed the Eaton and Corden framework inside the firm <laughs> to think of, to have a theory for how much firms are going to buy uh, from different markets. Now, this is different from Eaton and Corden in the following way, in which we're not only going to have a theory for 
whether a given US firm is buying uh, this amount of dollars or that amount of dollars uh, of inputs from different markets, but we're also gonna have a theory of which particular markets are they gonna activate, okay? So this is the extensive margin, okay? So that's where uh, uh, we're gonna connect with the Mallets framework in which firms are gonna uh, endogenously kind of choose those, uh, those markets. Now the rest is uh, sort of functional forms and I, I don't think I should be spending my time with them, but what Eaton and Corden basically figured out is that this decision of where to buy goods from, which they thought about it from the point of view of consumers buying goods worldwide, there was a, keen, a very nice connection to discrete choice models that uh, McFadden and others have been worked, uh, had worked on and that perhaps by parametrizing the distribution of productivity in certain ways and invoking extreme value distributions, perhaps that was gonna lead to a tractable representation of those choices. And that's what Eden and Corden basically uh, uh, used. And what it delivers is uh, basically a theory uh, in our setting of market shares. That is, if you take a firm in the US, uh, market I, and you're trying to figure out uh, uh, conditional on the set of markets that you, or source countries that you see that firm buying inputs from, if you wanna understand whether it's gonna buy more from China or other markets, those market shares kind of map to some key parameters of the model. Uh, parameters these govern the state of technology of various countries, so other things equal, we would expect US firms to buy more inputs from countries where workers are more productive, but perhaps those countries have higher wages and that would have a negative effect on those market shares, and perhaps the US, US firms are gonna be less likely to buy inputs uh, from uh, countries uh, uh, in which buying inputs from those markets entails uh, particularly large costs, okay? So again, for those of you familiar with Eaton and Corden frameworks, uh, this should look familiar, but this is basically market shares that are uh, 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 at, the, at the firm level, and uh, the denominator in this market shares is just the addition of these terms across the set of countries in which a firm is buying from. Uh, this is what we're gonna call a sourcing capability, and what's kinda neat uh, about this uh, specification is that if you then wanna compute the marginal cost uh, of a firm, it turns out that it's a simple power function of this sourcing capability. So firms here are deciding whether to activate certain markets or not. When they activate a market, they might pay a fixed cost of doing so, but the benefit of it is that by e being able to source from a new market, there might be some goods, some inputs, that they were previously uh, sourcing from different markets and that are now more cheaply available from these new sources, okay? So you're gonna have this trade-off governing the extensive margin of trade, which is if I now import from China, I'm gonna lower my marginal cost but perhaps it is costly for me to be able to do so. I need to send somebody to tell me which suppliers uh, can help me out. Okay, so in terms of the profit function, uh, we have this final good producers that are combining those inputs end up with a marginal cost that is a function of the set of markets that they've activated, where this index IIJ is a zero one index that tells you, that takes a value of one if you've activated a given market, but activating a market entails this fixed cost, uh, which we denote uh, by F and that are in terms of labor, okay? So now you have this trade-off um, um, that is crucially governed by the key parameters of the model and particularly by this uh, parameter sigma, which is the elasticity of the demand faced by the firm and a parameter theta that governs uh, the extent to which uh, uh, productivity levels uh, for a given input are gonna vary across uh, different sources. Um, now, what you get out of this is this result, which is that if you thought about the choice of I, the choice of the extensive margin of trade, uh, it is clear that as long as sigma minus one is not equal to theta, you're gonna be in a world with interdependencies, okay? It's gonna be a world in which whether you import from, import from uh, China or not, it's, gonna be, it's not gonna be independent from what you've decided for other countries. So instead of having, uh, say, uh, uh, J01 decisions, you have a much more complicated uh, set of decisions, but it is more complicated in a very particular way, which is governed by the relative size of this parameter. So if it, sigma minus one is higher than theta, which we argue and we show in the paper is sort of the empirically possible case, it turns out that these interdependencies take the form of increasing differences. And what does that mean? It basically means that yes, you cannot think about these decisions in isolation, but every time a firm is able to buy inputs from a new source, by reducing the marginal cost of the firm and increasing the optimal scale of operation of that firm, that can only make it more likely that adding new sources of inputs is gonna be uh, profit enhancing. Okay, so there are interdependencies, but in a way in which generates a positive correlation between 
uh, core productivity and then the extensive marginal trait and uh, 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 generates decisions that are sort of interdependent in a systematic way. For similar reasons, if you're again in the sigma minus one higher than theta um, uh, situation, this is a situation of complementarities that are not just uh, complementarities in the extensive margin, but turn out to be complement turn out to generate complementarities in the intensive market mar margin. In the following sense, there's a lot of text there, but essentially what this uh, proposition says is that as a result of a shock, call it the China shock, that reduces the cost of certain inputs from certain markets, you would expect that uh, this would tend to have a positive effect on the import demand from third markets. That is, there is a substitution effect. If China becomes cheaper, I'm perhaps gonna buy less from the US, but through this marginal cost reduction effect, you actually can generate complementaries. So for the set of firms that are benefiting from this marginal cost reduction, perhaps because when China liberalized, they went out and bought inputs from China, we expect these guys to not just go to the China and, and shut down in the US, but actually increase uh, their use of uh, intermediate inputs, okay? And this is one of the uh, uh, predictions of the model that we're gonna take to the data. I'm a little bit lost with, with time. Do you have a sense of uh, when do you want me to stop? <laughs> okay, um, I'm not going to take twice as much time as I talk, but I, I, uh, I will go on for the time being. So let me tell you uh, uh, what we do in the data. Uh, how we take it to the paper to the, the model to the data is we're going to use uh, U.S. data. Let me highlight a couple of uh, uh, <laughs> a couple of things that are key. I think, which is. We're gonna use US data, but it is gonna be very important to not just look at uh, manufacturing activities. When I'm talking about how the uh, uh, ability of US firms to go to China and reduce their marginal cost that enhances their import demand, this may not be in the form of manufacturing activities. This could be Apple uh, giving up on manufacturing and expanding uh, 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 the demand for other services that are provided by different types of activities in the US. So this is where, uh, uh, um, uh, our co-author, Teresa Ford, really came to the rescue. She had uh, worked on her, for her PhD dissertation in painfully mapping, matching the different censuses coming out of the U.S. census, not just the U.S. manufacturing census, but the census uh, 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 of other types of activities. So we have a sample of firms that do some manufacturing, but crucially, we have information on their activities outside of manufacturing, okay? Um, so in terms of the structural estimation, it's, it's in three stages, but essentially what we do is we first use the firm level information. So for each US firm in a given point in time, we know where they're buying all their inputs, from which markets, uh, including the US, and we map those market shares at the firm level to the formula that I quickly showed you, okay? And we realize that uh, uh, for, uh, it's a little dangerous to do that, but notice that for profits, what matters is this uh, term here, which happened to be uh, the term that was in the previous uh, uh, market share equation. So this is something that can be easily recovered uh, in regressions in which you look at this firm level market shares uh, and you run them on uh, country fixed effects. So once you have the country fixed effects, you have these terms, which we know are the relevant, the sufficient ones that are relevant for profits. Then we have, uh, uh, um, uh, we, have uh, we use, uh, uh, some information on, on, on labor costs to uh, recover the parameter theta, and then sigma we uh, uh, back out from markups, uh, which we have uh, in the US data. The last stage, which is the most uh, um, difficult one, uh, um, and don't ask me many details because this is way above my uh, empirical abilities, is where we use this GIA algorithm that I mentioned before, uh, which basically um, uh, uh, leverages this, uh, th this notion that the entry decisions are interdependent but in a way that, are, that is complementary. So even though uh, you know, the state space you think is uh, absolutely uh, uh, impossible to handle, there's a very simple iterative algorithm that can uh, allow you to solve the firm problem for a very large number of countries. So you can solve this problem firm by firm and essentially what we do is we back out from the data uh, the set of fixed costs that rationalize the extensive margin decisions that we observe in the data. And this is done through a simulated method of moments where we're simulating data based on our model and we 
uh, compare it to some moments uh, of the data. What comes out of it are estimates of what we call the sourcing potential, this TW term, that is how good it is to, how cheap it is to buy input from different markets. So that tells you that China is a country that perhaps doesn't have the best technology, but wages are so low that conditional on buying from China, firms buy a lot from China. But notice that China is also a high fixed cost environment. Why do we back this out? Because we don't observe a lot of firms going to China the, despite the fact that it has very low wages. Okay? So that basically tells you that there's quite a lot of variation in how appealing different markets are and how costly it is to first uh, import from them. And crucially, these things are uncorrelated, so it's not like there's an obvious correlation there. With the structural estimates uh, at hand, we can then uh, play around with the model. We can say, okay, these are the parameters that rationalize a year in time, 2007, but now we can say, what happens if you start jacking up some trade costs or lowering them? And the exercise we do is we uh, do a sort of a reverse China shock. So we try to understand uh, if we kind of match the change in the appeal of China as a source of inputs that we observe uh, from uh, 1997 to 2007, and remember that China enters the WTO in that period, uh, what kind of things happen in the model? Uh, 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 you know, what does that model predict? And our model predicts that indeed there's going to be declines in uh, 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 employment overall because the entry of China is basically uh, uh, leading to a more comp you know, fiercely competitive environment, but there's the very much heterogeneous effects. There's firms in our model that as a result of the, uh, uh, of the China shock are selecting into importing from China when they were not buying before, they're lowering their marginal costs and they're actually creating jobs in the US. Okay, and this, uh, uh, this uh, um, gross, uh, this distinction between gross and net is quantitatively quite important. Uh, so, uh, finally, what we do, and again, I'm not gonna uh, get into the details, but if you don't believe our model, you might say, well, uh, uh, I'm not sure that I'm gonna buy anything that comes structurally from the model, uh, but this result, this interdependent, this complementarity result is sort of intriguing. Can you find any evidence, like reduced form evidence for that? And that's what we do where building on the order et al methodology uh, 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 to assess uh, the effects of the China shock on US manufacturing. We adopt their setting to an input setting and we find results that are very much in line with our, what our theory predicts. That is, uh, perhaps counterintuitively, but we do find that firms that as a result of the China shock selected into buying from China, uh, they tend to kind of uh, increase the demand for uh, um, U.S. intermediate inputs. Now you might say, well, there's obvious endogeneity here. The firms, you know, if, if there's some shocks that make firms go up and down, they're gonna increase import demand from all markets, but this is precisely where the instrumentation is gonna help you. I mean, if you can introduce plausibly exogenous variation in this, it's as if you were sort of randomly placing some U.S. firms in China and then seeing what that does to their, uh, to their input demand. So that's the first paper. Uh, maybe I'll take, uh, I think, 10 minutes. Uh, to tell you a bit about uh, 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 this second uh, paper, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be nice to just talk about uh, spiders, I should tell you about snakes, okay? So again, remember, uh, snakes is basically motivated by this type of picture. It's very different. This is not gonna be a model where we're just buying inputs and sort of putting them together in a country. It has to be a model uh, that where uh, there's some aspect of sequentiality, okay? So uh, let me tell you first, um, you might say, okay, fine, there's sequentiality, what's the big deal? I mean, you know, why, um, why can I not just take the previous model that you work with and just think about that instead of combining all these inputs, uh, now you just do one at a time and the, and the good is moving across borders. So one thing we realized when writing this paper and in other work that I, uh, uh, that I had worked on sequential production is that actually, um, if you want to think about sequential production in a world with costly trade, uh, it is not as simple as you might think. That is. Let me first ignore uh, trade costs. Trade costs. Suppose you're in a world with free trade, so I had some TAUs and some fixed costs. Suppose I ignored that, then it wouldn't be so hard. That is, um, I could think about a world in which, uh, say, a uh, uh, um, semiconductor's producer is trying to figure out where each stage of the value chain should be produced. It realizes that it can have each of these stages in many countries. There's slaver productivity that varies across countries, different wages, and stage by stage, they would just choose the cost-minimizing location. And perhaps some Eaton and Cordham trick, like I showed you before, would, would just be all that you need. Now, the problem with uh, sequentiality is that the moment you have trade costs, then you can no longer make these decisions of where to locate the production of each stage independently from each other. 
So I'm coming back to an issue of interdependencies, but this is very different from what I've just spoken about uh, before. Before it was about the extensive margin, marginal cost reductions. This is just interdependencies that have to do with the fact that where you have something done is gonna be a function of where the prior stitch was done and where it needs to go. If you're putting together a car and you wanna decide where the wheels are gonna be produced, you might wanna take into account where the rubber is coming from and where the assembly plant is gonna be. And if assembly and rubber are in Brazil, going to Indonesia for wheel production might not be the right thing to do, even though they might be a really, really good supplier of wheels in Indonesia. So in this paper with Alonso, uh, we've been thinking about this problem. And there's, there's a bit of a connection with the logistic liter literature uh, uh, that has sort of looked at similar questions when thinking about optimal path of delivery of packages and things like that. So what we do in this paper is we develop a general equilibrium model of GVCs um, that, uh, that is basically going to allow for a fairly general, what we call a geography of trade costs. That is, as in the previous paper, we're going to allow for arbitrary trade costs across countries. So, we're not going to be in a world of free trade like uh, previous models of sequential production had uh, uh, worked with, uh, perhaps realizing the sort of issues that arise in a world of free trade, uh, of costly trade. So uh, the paper does several things, which I cannot possibly cover uh, 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 in a few minutes, but let me highlight uh, a couple and then uh, give you a couple of details. So on the theory side, uh, when writing down a model of sequential global value change, we learned something that we didn't realize when we first wrote down the model, which is perhaps uh, in a world in which we're interested in understanding why some countries are in certain segments of value chains, they're downstream, upstream, and there's a lot of policy interest in understanding where in value chains countries are and should be, there's, uh, uh, there's a natural role for uh, geography to shape that. That is, if you think about countries differing on where they are in the world in terms of how central they are, think about China, this is a very central country. It's very close to Japan, to Korea, it's not far from the US, it's extremely close to China itself. And compare that to a country like uh, um, Australia, which is a much more remote country. There's not that many rich countries around it, or think about Argentina. So there's natural variation across countries in how central they are, and our model says there's good reasons to believe that relatively central countries should be in relatively downstream stages of production. Okay, so here in our previous, uh, no, I'm gonna go back. Uh, in the previous example, the, the semiconductors, there's a lot of assembly in China. Now there's a lot of reasons why assembly is in China, maybe low labor costs, but what we would argue is that uh, where China is in space actually matters, and we provide some suggestive evidence for that. Perhaps more excitingly, what we develop in the paper is tools for making this uh, uh, problem that looks pretty complicated, where uh, you need to think about this, uh, uh, location decisions uh, interdependently with other decisions, we make it work and develop tools to kind of solve it in environments that could be really highly dimensional. And again, uh, this has to do with, on the one hand, developing algorithms that uh, make this work, but also through the use of dynamic programming. This is what really turns out to make things uh, much simpler. And then there's a third leg of the, uh, of the paper, uh, which kind of connects a little bit with the previous paper, and which we want to go just beyond theory and we want to take this to the data and understand not just qualitatively but quantitatively um, uh, how uh, things change, how certain counterfactuals change, how the gains from trade integration change in a world in which uh, 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 trade flows are the aggregation of these snakes that flow across countries. Okay? And again, it'd be great to put spiders here. We don't do that. We're always sort of looking things a little bit uh, in isolation. So we do that, we show how to map the model to observable data on the extent to which countries buy inputs from other countries, and we structurally estimate the model and again, uh, play around with some cu counterfactuals. So uh, uh, I think it's a, a bit late in the day to kind of uh, get into much details, but let me just give you a, a flavor of how we think about it. So we start from the most basic problem you can imagine. Okay, that's how we do theory. Uh, you might want to end up in a world in which there's a lot of snakes and the world is full of snakes, but you first start thinking about one snake. And what is a snake? It's a production process um, that's going to have end stages, and you're doing this because you can produce a final good for which there might be demand in many countries. Okay, so we have J countries, uh, end stages of production, the very last stage is assembly, and then we have a sequential production process in which you start with uh, an initial stage, which perhaps uses labor only, and then that stage is passed on to the next stage where it's combined with labor 
and so on and so forth. So it's a snake where at each point in time, an input in production is whatever was produced in the prior stage. Uh, again, uh, the, uh, the primitive factor of production is labor, and there's a wage rate that varies across countries, and there's this trade cost by which at a, every time that a good is crossing a border, there's some cost associated with that. And the way we model this is the standard way in trade, uh, in international trade, this is going back to uh, Samuelson in 54, which is to think about uh, 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 as if goods were melting in transit. That is, if you want one unit of the good to reach the other country, you need to ship a little bit more than one unit. And that extra amount you need to ship is an extra cost that is associated with international trade. Okay? And this is going to be a framework that is going to be very standard otherwise. It's constant returns to scale uh, and perfectly competitive markets. And Alonso and I have worked on environments with scale economies, and they are fascinating. Uh, but they're also a little bit hard to handle. So. Uh, for this paper, we kind of decided to, just to stick to a competitive environment, um, but there's many, many more things that one could play around with. So what we're trying to do here, and this is in partial equilibrium, is for a given destination of consumption, uh, we're trying to figure out what's the optimal path of production. If you want to deliver a car in the U.S., uh, sorry, uh, semiconductors to the U.S., where, uh, which particular path are you going to follow? So it's solving this production path that we denote by this vector L, uh, where each of this is the location of the different stages. Um, in the paper, we're a bit more general. A lot of the insights are actually more general, but it's very useful to work with this particular functional form for technology, which is saying not only you use the prior stage in production with labor, but this technology is Cobb Douglas with weights that are only a function of the stage of production, and the only variation in technology across countries is Ricardian in nature and has to do with labor productivity. In principle, technologies could be uh, varying in other ways, but it's sort of useful to think about that. When you look at it that way, then you end up with the following problem, uh, which is the problem of uh, finding the optimal path given a, a, a location of consumption, and it's a problem that's seeking to minimize uh, this object here. Now, this object has two parts. On the one hand, you have the part related to labor costs. That is, other things equal, uh, you're going to try to have each stage be produced in the country where labor costs are lower. And if that was, that was all there was to it, if all the trade costs were equal to one or they were common, there was no variation in geography, all you would care about is cost minimization, and you could do that stage by stage. This would be a rather simple problem to solve. But what this illustrates is what I mentioned before, which is the minute that you have this general geography of trade costs, you can no longer solve this problem location by location, you have to solve for the whole path. And this is a much higher, you know, higher dimensional problem, okay? Um, so that's, that's uh, point one, it, this is complicated. It turns out to be the case, however, that by the invoking dynamic programming, you can cut this into a series of stage problems that dramatically reduce the dimensionality of the problem. And I don't have time to tell you more about this, uh, but this is, uh, this is kind of cool and it helps us a lot when uh, solving the model for highly dimensional environments. The second point I want to raise is the following, which is the key uh, theoretical insight of the, of the paper, which is that uh, this <coughs> overall cost of production is telling you that yes, cost minimization would lead you to try to minimize trade costs, and in some cases you're gonna compromise and entail, uh, you know, incur higher trade costs because perhaps it's really, really cheap to produce elsewhere. But notice that the extent to which trade costs uh, increase overall costs is different depending on the stage of production that you take into account. And it's governed that this uh, exponent beta, which you can show, it's easy to show uh, that it's uh, monotonically increasing as you go downstream, okay? With an elasticity of one for the assembly stage and lower than one for other stages. So what this is telling you is that yes, firms are gonna be mindful in incurring high trade costs, but they're gonna be particularly mindful in incurring trade costs in downstream stages. Okay, so another way to put it is that um, locations that are remote that tend to be associated with high trade costs when shipping to and from those locations, these are locations that you're going to want to avoid in very downstream stages. Now, why are we getting that result? Exposed is not rocket science. We're getting that result because we're modeling trade frictions as ad valorem trade costs. The good is melting in transit. Trade costs are proportional to the value of the good. So therefore, as the value of the good rises along the value chain, it is more and more costly to incur tr high trade costs. Now you might go and say, well, you're doing this because Samuelson did it, and typically that's sort of a good rule of thumb. 
but you might want to wonder whether that's actually a reasonable assumption. And it is. Ad valorem tariffs are ad valorem. That is, you don't pay tariffs when you import iPads from China, you would all want to pay tariffs based on the Chinese value added, but that's not how it works. You pay it on the overall value of the good. You would want to pay insurance based on uh, the Chinese value added, but that's not how it works. So in a world in which trade costs are ad valorem, it is natural <coughs> that, uh, uh, um, that uh, cost minimization, trade cost minimization is going to be particularly relevant downstream. And that's the core of this comparative advantage result that I mentioned before. The rest of the paper, I'm out of time, is sort of building it into general equilibrium. And here, again, we're going to borrow uh, from Eaton and Cordham. And this is basically been a world in which it's not only just one good that you're trying to make available to consumers. It's a world with many, many, many goods. And you think about uh, aggregate trade flows across countries and final goods and inputs as the aggregation of this, all these decisions for these different goods. And we map this to uh, the type of data uh, that has been available, uh, become available in recent years, is world input output tables, which gives us not just information on what does a country like the US buy from other countries, but it gives us further information as to whether what the US imports from other markets are final goods or intermediate inputs. Okay, and that's, uh, I, said, and I skipped this slide, I realized this, the model spits out uh, uh, closed form solutions for these objects uh, that we can back out from data. And this is publicly available. You go download it. It's very easy to do. So then what we have is a, a structural estimation of the model where we're trying to match uh, different elements of this matrices. And uh, this is just to show you that we do a pretty good job. And obviously, uh, um, uh, I would, you know, ideally, I would have given you more details on how we do this. But it's all these elements of world input output tables that we match rather well, even untargeted moments of the data uh, that we match pretty well. And that allows us, once we have a model that actually maps to this aggregate data, we can play around with it. And I'll leave you with this figure, which shows you that uh, if you were to kind of consider, this is a bit of a crazy counterfactual, but it's late in the day. We can do crazy stuff. Uh, uh, where we move to a world in which we removed completely trade costs across all countries, you see this would generate massive increases in real income in many, many countries in the world in many, many continents. But what we show is that relative to a model without sequential production that was tailored to kind of match exactly the same data that we're trying to match, we would tend to generate even bigger gains from trade. That's not just true for this crazy counterfactual. It's more generally true. And particularly so for certain continents like Africa and uh, uh, Latin America, uh, sorry, and, and uh, um, the Middle East that are not particularly uh, embedded in this value chain. So that the idea here is that trade cost reductions are generating increases in real income that are higher because it's, you know, it's allowing us to not just benefiting from being able to buy French cheese uh, or, uh, 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 or uh, Chilean wine, but actually is allowing us to benefit from the ability of individuals in different countries to produce certain stages that are far upstream or far downstream in value chains. And that sort of has implications for uh, the workings of these models. But I'm out of time. Uh, obviously, one last thing I'm going to say, in both the first paper and the second paper, I've treated trade costs as exogenous. The next obvious thing to do is to acknowledge that part of those trade costs are man-made trade barriers that have to do with trade policy and other instruments. And you know, uh, for those of you that have been following what uh, Donald Trump has been saying, this is very much an instance where perhaps some of those styles are going to be changing due to uh, regulation. And there's a lot of interest in understanding what policies do to global value chains, how they change the positioning of countries in value chains, how a tariff in the US is going to affect US manufacturing. <coughs> if you sort of go back to the counterfactuals I've been telling you, they highlight that perhaps the effects are going to be much richer than you would uh, 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 think in a world in which you didn't take those uh, uh, interdependencies in mind. But I don't have much more to say about this, uh, perhaps uh, some other point where I have more insights on the effects of policies. And I'll stop here. I've not been working on international trade for more than 20 years, so perhaps I'm completely off the mark. But uh, just a curiosity, in, uh, 
In what you have said today, there is trade, but there is not a choice between uh, outsourcing and doing it yourself. And uh, I was working how this interact with the two different models, because uh, if you think of snakes, for instance, as successive production stages, this uh, uh, would uh, make a problem of double marginalization much more severe. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would seem that if you have a snake structure, you would tend to, to tend to vertically integrate more the production, which in turn would lead to some sort of interaction between the uh, spider versus snake uh, with uh, the trade versus uh, uh, multinational firms. Mm -hmm. Is that something that which has been studied uh, or is something which has uh, already been done or interesting at all? <laughs> I think it's very interesting, and it, I mean, um, I, th um, I think it's very interesting. I mean, I, I should say uh, I'm very sympathetic to thinking about this margin, so I spend the better part of my early career, and sort of that's how I got all this gray hair, trying to convince people that uh, firm boundaries matter, uh, that contract enforcement issues matter. Um, and people were giving me a hard time about it. And then I started working on competitive models with complete contracting, and I got all sorts of questions saying, how can you not have contract enforcement? <laughs> so, uh, so, um, so I'm sympathetic to that. I, I can, I, uh, you know, I have a, paper, a recent, you know, two, three years ago, paper with David Shore, uh, where we studied something that, uh, very much in line with what you have in mind, which is a model with sequential production, where we asked the question, um, if you allow firms to internalize stages of production, uh, where in value chains are, is internalization much more likely to happen? We didn't have a m double marginalization a story in mind. It was more of a, uh, uh, you know, incomplete contracting theory, um, uh, but it generated some sort of subtle and sharp predictions that, that we've taken to the data. And there's some interesting variation, I should say, in the extent to which firms seem to internalize upstream or downstream stages which is partly governed by demand elasticities and other parameters that might are also matter for double marginalization stories. So maybe we can talk more about it, but uh, there is some work, but there's not a lot of, uh, of it. I, I should, just in passing, even in spider, uh, uh, in spider models, there's a, a result that I put, it, put up, but I didn't comment, which is this, um, you know, this is a monopolistically competitive environment that we had in mind, so it's hard to, it's constant markups and so on. But um, there's this interesting result which says that if the extensive margin is correlated with size, given an initial distribution of core productivity differences across firms, a process of offshoring, increased offshoring, is going to lead to a higher skewness in the size distribution of firms. Because it's particularly the large firms that are benefiting from this process, that are going abroad and reducing their marginal cost in excess uh, of their already uh, existing cost advantage. So if you put that in a world with uh, more meaningful types of competition, uh, you know, market variation and things like that, that could actually also generate interesting insights. And that, that I haven't seen much work on, but I think it's interesting. Some other question? Um, so um, there's this, uh, I guess, mostly theoretical literature uh, on leap you know, backward linkages and uh, that don't assume constant returns to scale. And I guess uh, Andres rodriguez Claire and other people really thought about uh, uh, about this in, in, and how it affected development and so on. So I was wondering if, uh, you know, beyond this paper, you had any thoughts on how to, you know, move away from constant returns to scale and how can this, may, you know, this more, uh, uh, you know, quantitative uh, results can relate to this, uh, this previous literature. So this is a question for Alonso more than for me, I think. Uh, he knows more about this than I do. But um, yeah, we've thought about it. I mean, sort of an obvious thing is, um, an obvious limitation of the second paper is that in a model with constant returns to scale and uh, competitive, and a, you know, particularly uh, constant returns to scale, there's not going to be a sense in which sort of flowing through a location in a given stage uh, might be a function of where in various value chains uh, you're going to be next, okay? So, uh, and I, I think there's a lot of people that have in mind that scale is important, uh, that being able to kind of scale up is important for being able to kind of tap into certain stages of the value chain. So we worked with a model that had some of these features um, and you can generate kind of cool insights in which all of a sudden 
solving for optimal paths becomes much, much more complicated. And actually the links to the logistic literature, traveling salesman problems and problems that are not easily, the dimension of which is not easily reducible with dynamic programming, uh, the structure of those problems is much more similar to that. So uh, we might play war with that. I think part of the interest is, is indeed in policy. If you want to think about policy in a GVC world, we can have we can get some insights of, uh, out of our framework already, but I think it would miss issues that have to do with external economies of scale, of you know which are the particularly dynamic segments of value chains you want to be in, or issues of market power, of where are you going to appropriate uh, value depending on sort of uh, um, uh, market structure that are not in our, in our framework. So that's something that uh, you know we plan to think about it, but trying to generate uh, some interest too if, they, if there's people that, uh, that want to dive in. There's clearly a lot to be done. Okay, so uh, um, given your uh, first paper, what is your opinion, this negative opinion on trade following the David Author et al. Uh, series of papers? No, in your paper, there yes. is good effects, no, for the local economy in the United States. Yeah, th there's the, um, so there, there's a, there's a, there's a, a narrow question and a, and a bigger one. So we could debate about that particular paper, um, and there's, um, there's been an intense debate about exactly how to read that paper um, in terms of um, there's some clear findings, there are neat findings, but how you interpret the macro picture that comes out of it is a little bit less obvious in terms of explaining the magnitudes of, of the employment decline. Um, what we're saying is we're not necessarily saying that um, uh, certain areas in the U.S. might have been hit more intensively than others, but we're questioning at some level is uh, their implicit assumption that when you move from their estimates to macro aggregates, uh, areas that they would say are not affected by China, which in their definition would be areas in which uh, firms in that area did not produce goods uh, competing with China, uh, that the effect in those areas is zero. Because we would argue maybe those are areas that are doing things that are different from what uh, 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 China was doing, but maybe they're doing things that are parts of production processes of U.S. firms in other areas, and perhaps this China shock was actually generating uh, positive effects. Okay, so what the baseline is, is is a bit less clear. So at some point we thought about, you know, our, our our identification is really coming at, at the product level. It's, we're not doing anything with uh, local labor markets, which is what they did. It'd be interesting to revisit that and, and get a sense of what the baseline might be in a world in which firms are allowed to import uh, inputs or in a world in which firms are allowed to export as well, which is something they didn't take into account. Um, and that's the connection I see. I mean, there's, uh, um, I, I think they got it right that, uh, um, that the China shock has been uh, uh, costly for some areas, and clearly that's the sentiment among a lot of people. It's hard to kind of make sense of recent political developments in the U.S. without taking that into account. But I think that doesn't mean that people are right, or that people are computing this counterfactuals of what would it imply to kind of increase tariffs with China by 20% the right way. I'm not. I'm less sure about that. But be, before, uh, I repeat, I will ask you to wear with us for five minutes, but before that, let me thank uh, uh, Paul, uh, first of all, for accepting our, our invitation. It was not easy for him to accept it. Yesterday he was in Budapest. I should not have been surprised that he accepted because he's always very helpful. Uh, in helping uh, in help, in helping us, so thanks. What I did not expect is that we will get two papers for the price of one. So <laughs> thank you very much, uh, and also thanks to Alonso de Gortari, who is somewhere uh, here, and uh, best wishes for the ordeal of the job market uh, that is, uh, that is uh, coming. Uh, <laughs>
And that say, uh, we take five minutes for the concluding uh, 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 se session with the president of the society, uh, uh, Mr. Eduard Arruga. Let me just say, I will talk about the Congress, we'll talk a moment on the society. I have not been able to poll the members of the Scientific Council, but I think that uh, they will be uh, satisfied. Uh, this, uh, if, you, if, you, if I look at this room and I see the hour and the day, 7 o'clock on a Saturday, uh, so uh, this has been definitely a successful uh, enterprise. Uh, yeah, on the one hand, it, uh, it, it has satisfied what uh, we pretended, uh, the purpose. Uh, it has been on the, on, on the, on the one hand, a reasonable showcase of uh, the economics that is being done uh, in, the, in, um, in Catalonia, and not only. There has been uh, uh, presentations from Valencia, from the Balearic, uh, from the Balearic Islands. And uh, in the second place, it has also fulfilled very well the networking role of uh, meeting points. So I know that people have been satisfied of seeing uh, people they had not seen in a number of years because they are dispersed uh, around the world. And I hope that the people dispersed around the world have also find this, the, this uh, an interesting uh, experience. I, I, I cannot resist mentioning the couple of people that I saw networking here, and they are in the same city somewhere else, but uh, they network, <laughs> they, 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 meet, they meet here. Uh, so I think this has been uh, successful. Uh, thank you very much. The Scientific Council, the, 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 the members uh, were uh, extremely, uh, extremely um, uh, collab collaborative. It's, uh, but I still want to, uh, to single out um, and the efforts of uh, Elisenda Pelusie and other, and other Ferrer, that uh, the, in the last days, uh, in the last days, some last moments, in which an extra effort is needed, and uh, they too uh, provided uh, that extra effort. So thank you very much, uh, Ada and Elisenda. And uh, thanks to the organizing uh, committee, and in particular to uh, Jesus uh, Marin, who is somewhere, uh, somewhere uh, here. He's, uh, he is uh, uh, here, and that has been uh, the, um, I mean, the link between the Scientific Council and the Local Organizing uh, uh, Committee, and it has been a very effective link. And finally, and with this I passed uh, I pass to Eduard Arruga, thanks to the uh, society for the help uh, provided and for the initiative. This was an initiative of the society and um, we were asked to, collabor uh, to collaborate. So, Eduard, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Allow me to say three short remarks, one about the past, other, another about the present, another about the future. Past. As I said yesterday, the main goal of our uh, Societat Catalana de Economia is to promote the research on economic science and on uh, Catalan economy in particular. We usually make a lectures here in this room or in other rooms of the Institute. But when at the beginning of last academic course, we said, what can we do more than a month lecture? And our secretary, Mr. Montserrat, put on the table the possibility of organizing exactly a conference. We take contact with our tutor, that is Professor Gali, a member of the Institute, and he accepted very well, and he immediately took also contact with Andreu Mascolelli. 
they both accept it immediately and take it with enthusiasm. So we were decided to go on. The first steps, I had to say to you, were in the January 2016. So that we have been working for more than one year in the organization in, of this uh, Congress. Now we are very happy. Thank you very much, Jordi. Very, thank you very much, Andreu, for your efforts and your devotion to that. Present. Simply, I, uh, I want to remark what the uh, thanks that Andrew has said, but also thanks all of you. You have devoted to the conference two main resources, your talent and, and your time, and both are very important for you and for us. We hope that the time you have spent coming here, working here, etc., have had a good result, so the cost-benefit analysis has to be positive, and that, that you will take advantage of this. Thank you very much for all these contributions, for your comments, for your remarks in the different sessions that we have had. Finally, the future. It is said that this is the first. Usually, there is no a first without a second. Uh, the second has to come. Please, uh, we have to take our time. It will not be immediately made the second conference of the Catalan Economic Society, but we will think on that and we hope sincerely, that the efforts we have made, and you also all have made, will be profitable for the economic science and for the Catalan economy in particular. Thank you very much and enjoy Barcelona during the rest of the day and uh, your days here. Thank you very much. Thank you.